Uh, well, hello, everybody. And I suppose the first question is why the question? Why that question? Why would a stronger capitalism get poor countries closer to socialism? Because you might think on the face of it that poor countries, well, what's stopping them? They're poor. They need a revolution. Uh, it seems on the face of it quite obvious, but of course it isn't. And the reason it isn't is because of the theory of stagism. Stagism is the idea that you have to have uh, capitalism uh, uh, and a full bourgeois revolution, including development of advanced capitalism. You know, it's, it's, it's back to about a bourgeois revolution, which is political, bringing in constitutional reforms, democracy, and so on, but also actually the development of capitalism itself, industry, um, capital accumulation and investment. And then once you have that, then you can go into socialist revolution. And that was the standard theory amongst Marxists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, these days, it's um, also embraced by some reformists, uh, and Stalinist people who are in communist parties or the pro-Soviet tradition coming out of communist parties. It's actually, so it's in many ways, it's um, a dominant position. It's an important position on the, on the left, not on our left, but it, it's, it's an important one which we have to argue against and have to show the lessons uh, of why we need an alternative. And what would that alternative be? It would be Trotsky's permanent revolution. The idea of actually permanent revolution in some ways is a, is a misnomer. Um, because what it really means is uninterrupted revolution from the bourgeois democratic re uh, revolution through to the socialist without, uh, uh, as it were, passing go, uh, without having to stop. Um, uh, and it's really been a key, key uh, aspect, and we'll see why, I hope, over the course of this presentation. So what's the context for this? Well, it, the theory is really developed by Trotsky uh, in the context of Russia and Russian backwardness. Um, in the early 20th century, at the start of the 20th century, Russia is certainly becoming a capitalist country, but it's way behind, if you like, the capitalist heartland of Western Europe, of Germany, Great Britain, France, and so on. But this backwardness is combined with an accelerated development of capitalism. Um, in many ways, what we're seeing is a small yet advanced working class, uh, and then, of course, also a vast peasantry. Communications, yes, there are railways across Russia, despite its still virtually feudal state. So it's a real mix. Uh, and it's, this is the key dimension which Trotsky puts his finger on. Um, in 1905, of course, the revolution, the Russian Revolution of 1905, which is basically a bourgeois revolution, conf confined mainly to St. Petersburg, uh, somewhat in Moscow, but, but a bourgeois revolution which is led by workers, led by workers organized in Soviets. Um, this is really the second time after the Paris Commune that we see this kind of decentralized workers' councils being formed on the ground, the Soviets, which become such an important dimension of uh, Russian Revolution in 1917. Um, and it's, it's Trotsky's experience in this revolution, his leading, leading role he plays in it in St. Petersburg, which then brings him to the conclusion that you actually need this continuous revolution, it's no good stopping. And he draws these conclusions out in his book, his long pamphlet or book, Results and Prospects, published, I think, in, was it 07? 08? Anyway, it's written in 1906, reflecting on the, the 1905 revolution. Um, and of course, his theory is really confirmed in 1917, because the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks, to a great extent, too, in the intervening years between the two revolutions, don't really share that perspective. Um, but Lenin, of course, does arrive at a similar idea. Now, he never uses the phrase permanent revolution himself. But he arrives at a very similar idea immediately he arrives um, in, um, in Russia in April of 1917. Events are moving at such a pace that there's no question, as far as he's concerned, of stopping the revolution uh, when you have, uh, simply after you have a constituent assembly, elections for that. Uh, there's, no, there's no question that you should, it should be stopped there. Instead, you move onwards and onwards uh, with... Uh, Workers obviously leading the revolution across the country where the, where the majority is peasants and Bolsheviks at the head of the workers. So Lenin, if you like, de facto uh, arrives at a theory of the permanent revolution. But the permanent revolution also depends on the idea that you need to have international revolutions. You need to have co-revolutions, if you like, around, uh, in this obviously, in this case, advanced capitalism. You need the crucial intervention of Germany, um, other advanced capitalist countries. And of course, the revolutions uh, post-1918, post, post the revolution, post the First World War, fail in Western Europe. Germany, Hungary, Italy, and of course, I mean, lesser agitation taking place in, in, in this country too, of course. But these fail. 
Um, and the, the result, of course, is socialism in one country. The famous phrase, which is actually taken up by, by Stalin to actually justify it, but of course, it's actually a sign of, a sign of ultimately, a failure, a sign of um, weakness of, of, of a socialist revolution if it can only take place in one country. And of course, Trotsky argues against this policy, this endorsement of that, this, this idea of protecting the revolution, protecting the bureaucracy which has arisen uh, in it uh, uh, by basically speaking, suppressing attempts to, to um, have revolutions elsewhere. And the case that really is so tragic and becomes so vivid for Trotsky, and he, he, he talks about in his book, The Permanent Revolution, is what happens in China, where um, you have a situation where the nationalists, the re representing the bourgeois forces, the bourgeois revolution, um, supported by the Comintern, the, uh, the communist international, um, they, they effectively um, attack the communists. And this is approved of, effectively, by the Comintern. You have a sort of situation in which the Communist Party itself in China and the workers rise up in Shanghai, and then Chiang Kai-shek's uh, Kuomintang forces come in and slaughter them. Um, and so again, Trotsky now turns to his theory of permanent revolution and applies it to a semi-colonial country, China being, of course, heavily influenced both politically and, of course, economically exploited um, in that period. And he applies the, the, the theory of permanent revolution to show this is what we need to do. We, we far from, from, uh, from bowing down to the, to the, um, to the bourgeois revolution, which actually has, has turned into a, a, a mass slaughter of workers' forces, uh, we need to carry on and carry forward it. And he brings this uh, into his argument with the Salmists. Okay, so what's the theory and outline? In poor countries, we can say, we can sum it up by saying, capitalism piggybacks using the technologies already developed in more developed countries. So it enables poor countries, this piggybacking, to uh, develop quickly, but often incompletely. And that leads to a small, but often politically very advanced working class. Typically, poor countries will have a high proportion of foreign capital with a small local bourgeoisie, the working class concentrated in relatively small number of cities and a rural peasantry that's often working land owned by large landlords, often landless. Um, now in this situation, the working class can take political leadership, pulling the peasantry behind it and pushing the petty bourgeoisie and even sometimes the middle bourgeoisie, the middle classes along in some cases too. And really it shows the flexibility and adaptability of the Marxist approach. Um, and as we'll see, it can be applied to struggle in the 21st century just as much as it can in the first half of the 20th. So we're going to look at a couple of case studies today, Bolivia and Egypt. Um, so let's look first at Bolivia. Bolivia is the poorest country in South America. It has a 50% indigenous population, uh, much higher than, than, than any other country in South, uh, South America. Uh, it relies heavily on tin mining, the export of tin, gas and oil too. Um, since the 80s, 1980s. That's in the, um, the Western Amazonian part of the country. And it has a large landless peasantry. Um, there was uh, uh, an important 1952 national revolution. We might sum it up as saying a permanent revolution halted. What actually happened was that the miners rose up, defeated the army, um, and then uh, it was a key role of the COB, uh, uh, Federation of Unions, uh, Centrale Obrero Boliviano, a kind of workers' centre um, confederation. Also peasant councils in the countryside, but the bourgeois MNR party takes the lead, seizes the initiative, and it betrays the revolution. Um, it grants only limited land reform. There had been um, uh, an assumption that, that would be proper land reform to distribute land to peasants, or even to possibly collectivise it. Um, there was supposed to be nationalisation of tin, but that was only partial. So really we have then a classic example of a revolution, permanent revolution, which is halted, not even halfway. And then um, up until from 1964 to 2005, the situation get, moves rightwards. Uh, it's the rule of the right and actually mostly military dictatorships. Quite a well-known dictator called General Banza, uh, a particularly nasty piece of work. Um, and that's for that long period from the mid 60s to the mid 2000s. But we also get the rise of indigenous social movement in the early 2000s, a kind of uh, race class consciousness uh, amongst the indigenous masses in Bolivia. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, increasing state rep repression then uh, against that movement, but that in turn leads to increasing politicization. And it's in this context that Eva Morales and the MAS, the Movimento uh, al Socialismo uh, in Bolivia emerges. It then comes out very much of a, a rural, um, in fact, a co co coca growing uh, area of Bolivia. But it's also very much an immediate, in fact, also a movement of the working class in the cities, uh, the unions, the COB, which I mentioned in the context of 1952, sees a revival. Um, social movements, syndicatos, which are these rural, rural Soviets, if you like, and unions versus the state. And this really is a kind of form of dual power, in effect. In the early 19, sorry, in the early 2000s, uh, we see this taking a very uh, political turn, a, a turn which is based on fighting privatizations which had taken place, um, the water war and the gas war for reversal of privatizations in those sectors. And on the back of this intense class struggle, MAS and Morales win the 2005 election. And as many of you will be aware, I'm sure, um, this is really part of a so-called red tide across um, South America um, in, in several countries, uh, Brazil, Venezuela, uh, and so on. So let's look at um, what achievements um, we really get from the um, government of Morales and the MAS. Well, quite limited in a word. Um, we have 2005, we have the renationalization of oil and gas. There's an increase in social spending, 45% actually, between 2005 and 12. And that's really based on gas and oil revenues. And then there's a constitution that's important in 2009 because that brings in um, some indigenous rights. But there's no transformation of the economy. And there are no real moves towards slogan, so sorry, towards socialism. And the MAS slogan of Andean as Amazonian capitalism, um, that's actually the slogan they use, um, really sums up their approach. And it's, it's really an explicitly stages, stages approach, suggesting that you, ha you can't have socialism until you've got fully developed capitalism in Bolivia. And so, of course, there are parallels with Venezuela here. You have, um, by, by now, a long-serving uh, left popular regime which fails to take on imperialism and, and its own national bourgeoisie. There's no building on the basis of the working class and social movements. And instead, there's an attempt to produce a cross-class alliance with the bourgeoisie. And also quite an extensive use of patronage, um, which to buy people off, to buy sex, sex, sections of the working class and sections of the middle class off. Um, in the 2019 election, uh, it's very, very close, but uh, um, uh, it's declared actually against Morales. And the organization, he agrees stupidly to um, the organization of American states, the OAS, which is US dominated, um, arbitrating this election. And they give it to uh, his rival, Renin Agnès, from the so-called democratic socialist movement, social movement, which is actually an extremely right wing, hard right um, party. Um, and um, yeah, I need to finish that, sorry. Uh, it's an, she has an all right, all white, hard right cabinet and they embark on a program of de, de, so-called de-indigenization, which really means restoring racism in Bolivia, cuts to social programs. And you can see how the Americans, American capitalism responds. Elon Musk famously tweeted, we will coup whoever we want, deal with it. Um, but then in 2020, this year, mass mobilization of social movements and unions. They, they, they've been promising the government uh, and a, a new election, a, fre a fresh election, because it's been so contested. Um, and from the start of August, there's a massive mobilization. The government declares that there'll be an October uh, uh, election. And sure enough, MAS wins a massive majority with 55% of the vote in October. But the new president, Arce, he warns that austerity measures will be necessary. Uh, it's a familiar story, eh? Um, and it kind of shows exactly why a permanent revolution strategy is needed. You can't stop. Um, okay, so that's Bolivia. Let's have a look now at, at, uh, at Egypt. So um, Egypt actually also had a national revolution in 1952, um, but it was a rather different kind. Um, that revolution um, was against the monarchy of King Farouk, who was a kind of client king to the, to the British. Um, so it's very much a sort of, um, not formally, but, but in, in effect, 
uh, an anti-colonial uh, revolution, but it's also a military coup, um, um, which is uh, based on the small middle class, um, but it's supported by peasants and the sm even smaller working class. Um, so through the 50s and 60s, we have General Nasser in control, one party state, based on this rentier economy of income from the Suez Canal, oil and gas, and then some state-owned manufacturing, particularly cotton and textiles, which we'll see actually is quite important um, in the recent years. Um, despite privatization since the 80s, neoliberal privatization, we still have a situation in which six million workers, one third of the labor force, are employed by the state. But just as in Libya, there's the logic of, of neoliberalism. So you get precarity, decline in public sector, forcing down of wages, and all these things lead to resistance. Um, unlike Bolivia, where there's been uh, a long tradition of radicalization amongst the pe peasantry, rural Egypt is very conservative and actually played a counter-revolutionary role in the events of 2011. The working class is concentrated mainly along the Nile uh, River and the De Nile Delta. If you look at a population map of Egypt, you can see it very narrow, ribbon running up through the country and then fanning out into the delta, that's where most people live. Uh, Alexandria and Cairo are the two major cities. Um, but then crucially, uh, big population growth and a kind of demographic bulge of youth in the uh, 20, beginning of the 21st century. Um, we see over half the population, this is still the case, I think it's actually gone up, under 25. Millions of young workers, precarious, underemployed and unemployed. There's more than 25% unemployment amongst under 25s. And graduate unemployment is even bigger. So students and uh, graduates, young graduates, are um, uh, in large numbers and they play a major part in the 2011 uprising. So that uprising uh, really begins in the mid 2000s, widespread strikes in 2006. A key uh, area is the Malhalla, um, uh, textiles plant in the, in the, in the Delta. Um, that's where that sent, that's that wave of strikes is centered on. 2008, there's a demand for a general strike on April 6th, the April 6th movement, which links up workers and youth, and then the full on uprising of 2011. Key role of workers together with students and youth in Cairo. It's, um, the uprising takes place <coughs> in the Northern industrial towns, but also in Cairo itself, where people who are old enough to remember, it seems like yesterday to me, but I guess, that's just uh, me being an old fogey. But I can remember it well, and it was extraordinary, extraordinary moments to see uh, brave young workers and students occupying Tahir Square. As a result of it, the dictator Mubarak flees, and there's an election to bring in uh, Mohammed Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood, an <coughs> Islamist, um, an Islamist um, uh, party and regime. Um, but of course that doesn't last because again, um, it's, it's, it, it, it's repressive, it's a Islamic uh, regime he wants to institute, and there are, there are um, many, uh, uh, there's, there's a mass mobilization against that too. And so he's forced out in 2017. Um, but really again, we're seeing a lack of socialist demands from workers and youth. Um, the focus is on bourgeois democracy. Uh, it's all about the constitution, it's all about getting uh, a parliament, regular elections and so on, details of that kind of thing, rather than substantial change to economy and society. Um, and this despite the fact that we'd seen, you know, uh, workers striking, uh, it was potent had, had, had enormous potential as a, as a, as a permanent revolution. Um, but the opportunity effectively is lost. Um, in 2017, Morshi is forced out by renewed protests. Um, there's yet another constitution in 2014, and an election brings in General El Sisi. And really, this is a return now to military rule, though of a slightly different kind. It now has a kind of constitutional mask around it in a way which it didn't in the days of Nasser and, and um, Mubarak. Um, uh, and there are mass protests in September this year, just gone, um, against corruption and the hated El Sisi. So really, um, just to reinf reinforce that point, after the magnificent events of 2011, the Egyptian working class is pushed back. Um, but all those issues remain, they, they still there. Um, so what are the lessons to be learned from Bolivia and Egypt as far as the permanent revolution is concerned? Well, in Bolivia, 
um, Morales and Mass um, from a rural indigenous uh, social movement and politics, but really they can only achieve power through alliance with um, the uh, uh, unions and with organized labor. Uh, and indeed unions and organized labor take a leading role um, because when the stage moves to the cities, this class uh, manifests itself most strongly. Um, in Egypt, workers in old industries and state-run unions, and that's quite an important aspect of this, the workers in the large textile plants in the north are uh, basically in um, bosses, state-run, I should say, unions, but they take uh, a radical stance. And then there are also new independent unions. And of course, that's combined with the precarious unemployed youth and students who I mentioned already. Um, and of course, the role of social media in all this too, that's very important to Egypt. So again, a different situation, uh, a different mix of class forces, but what they have in common is that uh, potential at least for pushing through and the role of a small but vigorous and politically conscious working class. So this should really does show the potential for socialism in poor countries. But of course, the theory of permanent revolution is no panacea. It can't, on its own as a theory, uh, solve all the problems. And the key issue, uh, as ever really, remains the leadership of the working class. And we need a party. We need a party to make demands to advance the revolution, because without that, uh, without that party, which can, can make those demands, can coordinate action and take steps towards socialism, then inevitably mobilizations of the masses will collapse. And that's what we've seen, isn't it? Um, in, in both these cases and, in, in, and indeed, I'm sure in others, which comrades may well want to bring up in the course of the discussion. Um, and that's, of course, why we're here, friends and comrades. We're here to build and organize across the world and fight for the best bold strategies to lead a working class forward to socialism. Thanks very much. <laughs>